Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, for our in-house guests, we would ask that courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off. And, of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference. And our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Welcoming our guests and leading our program is Dr. Niall Gardner, director of our Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. He is also a former aide to Lady Thatcher. He has worked at the heart of Washington policy now for over a decade and is a leading expert on the U.S.-U.K. special relationship. He is a regular contributor to the London Daily Telegraph and appears frequently on both American and British television. And he received his doctorate in history from Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Niall Gardner. Niall. Uh, thanks very much, uh, John. Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I'm Niall Gardner, the director of the Thatcher Center for Freedom here at Heritage. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce the Right Honorable Liam Fox MP, the United Kingdom's Secretary of State for International Trade. Uh, today, Dr. Fox will deliver the 10th Margaret Thatcher Freedom Lecture on the case for free trade. The Freedom Lecture honors the principles, ideals, vision, and legacy of Lady Thatcher. Previous uh, Margaret Thatcher Freedom Lecturers have included uh, U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, the writer and author Charles Krauthammer, the official biographer of Margaret Thatcher Charles Moore, former Soviet dissident Natan Sharansky, free market economist Hernando de Soto, and former Prime Minister of Australia, the Honorable John Howard. Liam Fox has been a member, excuse me, Liam Fox has been a member of Parliament since 1992 and was appointed International Trade Secretary in July 2016 by Prime Minister Theresa May. He served as Defence Secretary of the United Kingdom from 2010 to 2011 and previously served as Shadow Foreign Secretary, Shadow Defence Secretary, Shadow Health Secretary and as Co-Chairman of the Conservative Party. Throughout his political career, Dr. Fox has been a staunch Thatcherite conservative, dedicated to the principles of limited government, economic freedom, a strong national defense, and a robust transatlantic alliance. He was a leading supporter of Brexit, ahead of the EU referendum, and today is playing a key role in shaping and advancing a post-Brexit US-UK free trade relationship, a partnership that will further strengthen the world's largest and fifth largest economies. Liam has been a frequent visitor to the Heritage Foundation for the past two decades, during which time he has worked tirelessly to advance the special relationship between the United States and Great Britain. I can think of no closer friend of the American people across the Atlantic than Liam Fox, and we are delighted to welcome him here today to Heritage. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be back in Washington. I never thought I would say this, but uh, I've seen more rain here in the last 12 hours than I've seen in London in the past two months. Um, I would like to thank our host, the Heritage Foundation, for inviting me to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished gathering on a topic that's not only close to my heart personally, but professionally, uh, and more politically relevant, I think, than at any time in the past 30 years, and it is, of course, an honor to be asked to give the Margaret Thatcher lecture. She was a staunch champion, not only of the concept, but the practice of free trade. In my first speech as Secretary of State for International Trade, I set out the case for an open and liberal trading environment. And that speech was in Manchester, in the north of England, home of the Industrial Revolution, a city with iconic associations to free trade. That was nearly two years ago, when trade barely registered on the radar of most of our media. And how different things are today, when trade is front and centre of the international political debate. The disputes between the US and China around NAFTA, steel and aluminium tariffs, and the UK's future trade agreement with the European Union are the most talked about issues of the day. 
It's therefore a good time for us to examine both our attitudes to trade from first principles and to measure them against our domestic priorities and our international obligations. It was just over 240 years ago, on the 9th of March 1776, that Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. It set out the principles for the emerging world of global commerce at the end of the 18th century with a vision of what trade could produce in terms of prosperity and opportunity. He countered the dominant mercantilist viewpoint, which was revolutionary in its time, and set out a case that is just as relevant today. Indeed, Adam Smith reminds us still that the essential element of a successful trading system is mutual benefit. David Ricardo took these principles of free trade forward when in 1817 he published the theory of comparative advantage. And building on Smith a generation before, Ricardo described the economic reality of the gains from trade and demonstrated how free and open trade is profitable to all. It's one of the most powerful concepts in economics, described by the economist Paul Samuelson as the only proposition in all the social sciences that is both true and non-trivial. It remains to this day the most fundamental justification of the power of free trade. Now, of course, since those days, since 1817, the world has changed beyond all recognition. Yet the experiences of globalization and of technological advances, unimaginable in Ricardo's time, have only served to validate his theory. The principles of free and open trade have underpinned the multilateral institutions, rules and alliances that helped rebuild post-World War Europe and the world beyond. They helped usher the fall of communism and the tearing down of the Iron Curtain. They facilitated 70 years of global prosperity and they have raised the living standards of hundreds of millions of our fellow human beings across the world. Indeed, free trade has allowed us to take one billion of our fellow human beings out of abject poverty in just one generation, one of the greatest achievements in our history. Just as predicted in the early theorizing by Smith, Ricardo and others, time and time again, we find a strong positive correlation between economic openness and growth. During the 1990s, per capita income grew three times faster in the developing countries that lowered trade barriers than in those that did not. And that effect is not confined to the developing countries either. The OECD growth project found that a 10% percentage point uh, increase in trade exposure was associated with a 4% rise in income per capita. Free trade works. <clears throat> Globally, as free trade has blossomed, poverty levels have fallen to their lowest in history, bringing industry, jobs, and wealth where once there was only deprivation. Trade liberalization gives consumers greater choice, and the competition it unleashes brings higher quality and standards at lower prices for everything from food and drinks to toys and automobiles. Free trade provides developing countries with the opportunity to embrace the international trading system, to integrate into global value chains, and ultimately to grow their economies. But the effects of free and open trade go further than simple economics. This is particularly true in the era of globalization and will become even more so in the future. I've already mentioned the fact that free trade has allowed us to take a billion people out of abject poverty in a single generation. But trade is not an end in itself. It is a means to spread prosperity. That prosperity underpins social cohesion. That social cohesion, in turn, underpins political stability. And that political stability is the building block of our collective security. It is a continuum that cannot be interrupted without consequence. If prosperity is denied to those who aspire to it, and free trade is a key enabler of this, 
we should not be surprised if the result is further mass migration across the globe or indeed political radicalization. And those of us, the world's richest countries, who have done well from a global free trade system, cannot simply say, we've done okay, and pull the drawbridge up behind us without us having to pay a price. There are many arguments in the worlds of politics and economics that will never be settled, just as well for both the politicians and the journalists here today. They are as much a matter of interpretation as they are objective data. But the effect of protectionism is as close to settled science as anything in economics ever will be. It means reduced productivity gains and lost economic growth. Long run historical trends suggest that a 20% reduction in trade holds back productivity by around 5%. <clears throat> Excuse me. And worse, in a world of globalization where interdependency is increasing and where disruptions in one part of the globe can quickly ricochet around the rest, our ability to act unilaterally with impunity is diminishing by the day. The 2008 financial crisis was just the latest example of how an economic earthquake in one part of the globe can soon be the financial tsunami for everybody else. We today are at an important juncture in the history of free and open trade and of the established international order. In many ways, the picture is actually a positive one. After several years of relative stagnation, the growth in global trade is once again outpacing the rise in global GDP, with trade predicted to grow by 4.5% in the next year, with GDP growing at around 3.8%. The global economy continues to rebound from the dark days of the financial crash and the ensuing recession that was experienced by many large economies. Yet it's also a reflection of how globalization and new technology continue to facilitate trade and the irrepressible growth of the digital and knowledge economies, sectors which hardly even existed two decades ago. And this is perhaps, perhaps, the root of our current paradox, which is this. We have seen the benefits of free trade at home and abroad. We are seeing a rise in living standards and a reduction in global poverty. We are witnessing our innovative industries achieve global dominance. Who 20 years ago could ever have imagined the global impact of Google, of Facebook or Amazon? Who would have believed how cheaply we could access the newest electronic gadgets from mobile phones with more computer capacity than the Apollo program, or the latest high definition TVs at seemingly ever more affordable prices. Yet even with all this evidence, all this evidence of the success of our own economics beliefs, the public, especially in the world's richest countries, are seemingly questioning the benefits of a free trading system with politicians seemingly caught in a crisis of self-confidence in what was once an article of faith for many. Perhaps at least part of the explanation lies in the rate of change and reorientation of our economies and the fear of actual and potential displacement felt by many workforces. In Britain, we have seen industries like coal mining all but disappear but new services and modern manufacturing take their place, including the growth of elements such as renewable energy. In areas such as steel production, we have seen new technologies enable us to produce the same output, but with far fewer employees. It is and will be new technology that will be the major disruptive force in our economies. We will best serve both our economies and our workforce not by turning our back on free trade, but by ensuring that we can provide mitigation for those who bear the brunt of change by providing the necessary economic support, especially in reskilling, retraining and education. Change is coming, 
and we must embrace it, for our global competitors certainly will. But we must be also willing to reach out the helping hand to men and women in our countries who will most feel the winds of change and use our skills, our experience and our knowledge to maximize the benefits for the generations to come. We can bring prosperity and revival to some of our challenged industrial communities as they transition to new patterns of work as they have always done. From the agricultural age through the industrial revolution to the rise of the knowledge economy changes forever with us. And rather than seeking to avoid the realities of the globalized economy, we should ensure that its rising tide lifts all boats. To do so, we require a set of global rules that are transparent, robust, and enforceable, and institutions that are credible and accountable. Despite its flaws, trade specialization and innovation, largely as a result of globalization, has spawned a productivity revolution through increased competition, economies of scale, and global value chains. When this is combined with the effect of liberal values of meritocracy, democracy, and rule of law, it can create a tidal wave of innovation and creativity. It's no coincidence that the United Kingdom and the United States are among the world's most innovative economies, while those with a more authoritarian regime are only now beginning to catch up as centralized planning, at least in some cases, gives way to greater individual creativity. In the 20th century, one of the products of the influence of the US and the UK in particular was the creation of the WTO. From the founding in the aftermath of the Second World War of the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, the WTO emerged as the home of the rules-based international trading system and the repository of those free trading values that have underpinned global growth and facilitated more formal trading agreements. It's worth remembering that these rules and the WTO itself are not an external imposition on our economies, but were largely shaped and codified by the work of successive British and American governments. In 1948, our nations were the founding members of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. In 1986, it was the US under President Reagan that launched the Uruguay round of multilateral negotiations that led to the establishment of the World Trade Organization. The United States has been at the heart of the WTO since the very beginning. Of course, the system that we established in 1995 is also in need of some refurbishment. After all, the global economy is now driven by advances in technology that were embryonic in 1995. Who could have foreseen then, for example, the rise of the digital economy, or how knowledge and data have become so valuable, or the blurring between goods and services? Just imagine the concept of selling a digital code on the internet so that someone could build something on a 3D printer. It would have sounded like science fiction when the WTO itself began. Now, the structures of the international system may not have caught up with the modern world, but that is cause for reform and renewal, not rejection. The UK and the US are ideally placed to work together to modernize and make the international rules-based trading system work better so that the benefits of free trade can truly be felt by all. Above all, the WTO remains the way to ensure that a level playing field is created and maintained between the major actors in international trade, but its rules must be enforceable and the actions of its members fully transparent if confidence is to be maintained. <clears throat> now, all of this is occurring in a period of rapid change in the patterns of global trade. The thriving economies of South and East Asia, and increasingly Africa, are and will become ever more important as their newfound prosperity drives demand for the goods and services from more advanced economies like the UK and the US. 
The sheer scale of the change that is underway is often difficult for many in the West to grasp, in countries which have long enjoyed economic and political dominance. Twice this year, I've been in the Chinese city of Shenzhen. When Britain, when Britain handed Hong Kong back to China in 1997, so looking around the audience, many of you are too young to remember it, but a lot of us do, Shenzhen had a population of just under 5 million. Today, it is a population of over 19 million. By 2030, China is expected to have more than 220 cities with a population of more than a million. The whole of Europe will have 35. And on top of the vast Asia-Pacific growth, it's predicted that there will be 1.1 billion middle-class African consumers by 2060. We are living through a period of profound and stunning change. And such a shift, not just in global demographics, but in the rise of the collective wealth of developing countries, will determine where the economic opportunities of the future will be and where we must be too if we are to provide jobs and prosperity for our peoples in the future. If we are to navigate the changes that the next decade will bring, we have to fully accommodate these changes and recognize the emerging pattern of our own trade too. We cannot wish away change any more than we can ignore its effects. As I used to say to my patients when I still practiced as a doctor, or as my wife said, when you still had a proper job, there's no point in complaining about the air when there's nothing else to breathe. Within a rapidly changing world, the trading relationship between the UK and the United States remains a consistent source of stability and prosperity. It is our two nations that have the opportunity now to negotiate a trailblazing modern free trade agreement. Because we both fundamentally believe in trading and commercial freedom, our interests are not in opposition to other countries. And trade between us is not a zero-sum game. The UK is the largest source of foreign direct investment into the United States, with around $560 billion worth of holdings here. More than France and Germany combined, and 30% more than Japan, the next biggest investor. Our investment is 20 times the investment in the US from China, and 30 times that of Mexico. British companies employ over a million workers across every state in the Union, from Ohio to Pennsylvania to Florida to California. And I don't know if we have any Texans here today. There's always at least one. More than 107,000 people in the Lone Star State are employed by UK firms. And I wonder how many of them understand that. Likewise, American firms employ huge numbers of British people. We have more than a trillion dollars invested in one another's economies, probably the most interdependent investment relationship between two countries on our planet today. Yet we are also on the threshold of a renewed trading relationship that will further enrich both our nations. For the first time in more than four decades, the United Kingdom will have an, an independent trade policy that we will require to forge closer ties to our closest economic partner through an ambitious trade agreement. It's an unprecedented, unprecedented opportunity for an ambitious and future-proof framework for our wider bilateral trade, and we must not let it pass us by. Likewise, we must not fail to take the opportunity for global leadership in the areas where we already excel, particularly in trade and services, and especially financial services. The UK and the US host the two leading global financial centers and are at the forefront of innovation. Our deep and broad relationship on financial services is a cornerstone of the modern global economy. We should make it even easier in the future for businesses to operate across the Atlantic through frictionless trade. 
Fundamentally, our close economic ties are underpinned, as always, by the strong personal links that tie our two peoples. We share a common language, mostly, but we also have ties of history, and even more importantly, of values. We must also be linked by our shared ambition to shape the global economy in ways that match our shared interests. It is not just in our economic, but in our strategic interests in the longer term. For the past century, our two nations have stood shoulder to shoulder against mankind's gravest security threats. We have saved Europe in the 20th century from the twin scourges of communism and fascism. We must have, now of all times, the optimism and self-confidence to shape the future for free markets, through free trade, for the benefit of free people. And I will leave you today with the words of another of my political heroes, President Reagan, who said, the freer the flow of world trade, the stronger the tides of human progress and peace among nations. There can be no greater prize than that. The only thing that will hold us back is the scale of our own ambition. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Liam, for a tremendous uh, Thatcher lecture. Really um, very timely, thought-provoking and uh, an extremely robust defense of the principles of free trade. Uh, I'd now like to um, invite some questions from, uh, from the media uh, first, actually. Uh, and uh, I'd like to call upon, um, uh, firstly, um, Mark Austin, Sky News. Well, we've had now over uh, a number. Oh, sorry. So uh, we've had now for a number of months uh, very constructive, ongoing discussions with the uh, administration on a number of fronts. We've got four trade working groups. We've got them on continuity agreements, bilateral liberalisations, the potential shape and scoping of a future trade agreement, and the work that we might do together at the um, WTO. Um, I've had a range of uh, very constructive meetings since I've been here, including with uh, Commerce Secretary Ross and uh, UST, our Ambassador Lighthizer. And we are moving forward with our preparations. Now, we are not entirely clear what the final shape of our relationship with the European Union is going to be. That, of course, is what we're waiting to see from them. But we can't wait to see what the shape of that will be before we start make pre making preparations. Uh, for what our future US-UK agreement might be. And we work through that. And uh, I met the president, as you know, when he was in the UK. Uh, and I was very encouraged by what he said about the future relationship um, that we can have. If there is a reservation about what the UK-EU relationship will be, that is only natural, given that neither the United States nor we nor the EU at the moment know exactly what that is likely to be in the end. But it's very clear what our level of ambition is. So just one follow-up. Are you confident that you can get a trade deal with the US by the end of 2020? Well, that will, it will always be dependent on the level of ambition that we set. And at the moment, we have a very, very clear view that that is in our bilateral interests. As I said at the beginning, um, to go all the way back to Adam Smith, uh, mutual benefit is the greatest basis for any agreement, and we see that as being not just in our economic uh, interests, but in our strategic interests as well. And I think sometimes that, that is forgotten, and uh, the reason that I mentioned the investment relationship is I think that people sometimes forget that trade and investment are uh, the opposite sides of the same coin. Thank you. Uh, next question from uh, Gary O'Donoghue with the BBC. Oh, oh, um, best chance of Britain getting a, a decent full-blown deal with the US is actually a hard Brexit 
rather than the halfway house that your government is now proposing. And is Donald Trump a protectionist or a free trader? Um, in terms of uh, our relationship with the European Union, we've been very clear what we wanted to see. Europe represents 43% of our trade, of our exports in, in goods and services. I mean, it is declining in importance at about one percentage point a year of the total, but it's still an important part of our trade. And we want to ensure that we have as much access to continuity of trade with the EU as possible, while not tying our hands on that element of trade that is growing, as the IMF say, they expect 90% of global trade in the next 10 to 15 years to be outside continental Europe. So we have a balancing act to, uh, to carry out and um, you know, whichever, whichever um, mechanism we put forward for that relationship, we're either attacked by those who don't want to have any relationship with the European Union at all, or those who want us to remain imprisoned in the European Union um, as it currently is. Um, the government will try to set forward uh, a pragmatic and reasonable basis for our future relationship, which is the offer we've put to the European Union at the moment, although we await their response. Um, what that, to be very frank with you, what that, res that relationship is likely to look like is dependent upon whether we get what I would characterize as a people's Brexit or a bureaucrat's Brexit. In other words, is this about maintaining the purity of the theology of the Commission and ever closer union, or is it about the people of Europe and their economies and their ability to trade and prosper with one another? That's the choice that, that Europe faces, and that's ultimately what will shape um, many of those relationships that we will have elsewhere, uh, the balance between the two. Um, the United States has always been a free trading country. While it's no secret that we have a difference um, with the administration over the utilization of the 232 mechanism, um, it's also no secret that we also share many of the uh, anxieties about the global economy, not least uh, with the Chinese economy in terms of overproduction, lack of uh, transparency about what is in the state and the private sector, access to elements of the economy, including the uh, services economy in China, and the forced transfer of intellectual property. So we share many of those issues. It's not a question of whether we believe that there should be free and open trade. It's largely about the mechanisms by which we actually achieve that. Right, so call on uh, Julia from no, ITV News. Um, today, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the, as, as I'm sure you're aware today, the EU officials are in the White House meeting with the president. You are not. Does that not just underline the fact that the UK remains on the sidelines, on the periphery? It underlines why we were right to leave the European Union. But surely you <laughs> must feel that you need to have more direct contact. Exactly why we want to leave the European Union. It's one of the reasons I campaigned and voted to leave was that I don't want the United Kingdom to be represented by those who are not accountable to the people of the United Kingdom. Our trading policy should be set by the UK government, accountable to UK voters, not, to bu not by bureaucrats in Brussels. While we're members of the European Union, we will, of course, continue to abide by our legal responsibilities. But I look forward, uh, as I have done for almost all my political life, to the day that we will be outside the European Union itself. That was just in case anyone was unclear about my basic view. <laughs> Very well said. Um, uh, Doug Palmer, Politico. Hi. Um, well, my understanding is that you can't begin negotiations with the U.S. or any other country until you've left the European Union, which is scheduled for March 29th, I guess. I mean, do you have a commitment from the administration that they're going to begin free trade talks with you uh, in April of uh, 2019? And how is it that the U.S. is going to be able to negotiate a new trading relationship with the U.K. if the U.K. doesn't know what its trade relationship with the European Union is going to be? Isn't that a bit complicated? Um, none of it, let me tell you, nothing about trade is simple. Um, that took me all about two hours to learn uh, in this particular portfolio. Um, uh, well, it's very clear, you're correct, we cannot negotiate uh, a trading agreement until we leave the European Union, which will be 
um, on the 29th of March next year. And just in case there is anyone listening or watching that thinks there's any chance that the UK will not leave the European Union, we are leaving. We're passing the legislative elements that enable us to do so, including just last week, our customs bill and our trade bill, which enable us to set up a trade remedies authority to be able to legally set our own tariffs and to be able to continue uh, the trading agreements that we have um, by nature of uh, our EU membership at the present time with third countries, all that is moving ahead. Um, what we will not be able to do is to implement a new trading agreement itself, even one that's negotiated and signed until after the implementation period, if indeed there is an implementation period. Um, anyone who's still with me? Um, one of the reasons uh, that we have to begin those preparations now is that you'll be aware that the USTR have to give Congress 90 days notification about their intention to begin a new free trade agreement. That means that uh, if we want to start um, on the 30th of March, that uh, notification has to be given to Congress before Christmas. That means that we have to complete um, our discussions inside government about the ambition of any agreement um, um, by that time. Um, and that means we have to complete our new consultation uh, with the British public by the end of October, which is why we had to start it last Friday. And I hate to roll everything backwards like that, but that is how we have to view everything from our point of exit at the present time. So we began, for those who, uh, who don't know, we began our public consultation um, with the British public, which is a 14-week consultation asking for evidence um, from businesses, from individuals, from, uh, from groups, uh, political parties, the devolved administrations, regional administrations. Um, uh, and we decided that we would do that for the United States for a potential free trade agreement with Australia, for a potential free trade agreement with New Zealand, and for potential UK accession to CPTPP. Um, we intend uh, over the coming months to keep all our trading options open. Um, you're quite right, we don't yet know what that final shape of that agreement with the European Union uh, will be. We hope it will be a full, open, comprehensive trading relationship because to do otherwise will be damaging to the economic interests across Europe. Um, but we fully intend, uh, at the earliest opportunity, to be furthering our independent trade policy. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. You said to me you can't wait until the sort of Brexit that you're going to get becomes clear to do a trade deal. And now you've just said we have to start a, a, a trade deal before we know what Brexit it no. is. We have to start a public consultation. You're saying, sorry, you, you're saying we can't start until we know what sort of Brexit no, is. So can't. which one is it? I don't no, understand. No, we have to start a public consultation. As I set out in the House of Commons last week, we have to start a public consultation on any future trade agreement far enough in advance to meet some of the legislative timetables that we might otherwise bump into. Uh, and that means not saying to the British public, do you think we should have a free trade agreement with the United States? Because opinion polls tell us they overwhelmingly want to have one. But what do you think the level of ambition should be? So that by the time that we have greater, cl we have greater clarity, we are already past uh, the point where we needed to consult the public. It's a question of timetables. It's not a question of lack of ambition. Has the administration indicated that they will, the indicated that they will notify Congress um, before Christmas that they intend to begin free trade talks with the UK? Well, we took that decision in the knowledge of what the timetable would be for us to be able to achieve that. It's still, it is still our ambition to begin those negotiations as soon as we leave the European Union. Okay, but you haven't got a firm commitment from them that they'll do that? Well, we know that that's when we want to begin. Um, the American process is well set out and we understood what that would be and what that, why that meant we had to begin our consultation. I say that because there are some people in the UK who wonder why we're starting it so early. Um, we have to do that to meet um, the legislative timetable that we set out for others, not necessarily for the UK. Okay. Yeah, and, um I'd like to call on Damien Paletta with Washington Post. Perhaps the Washington Post is absent today. So um, I'm going to now actually open up questions to, uh, to the, the audience, um, press or otherwise. Uh, so the, the lady in the front here. Um, you mentioned that no free trade adversely affects general safety and security. How do you see a lack of free trade affecting that in the future? Could you identify yourself as well in any oh, institutional yes. affiliation? I'm sorry, I'm from the American Spectator. 
Uh, thank you. Um, it's a much it's a much nicer rule than we have in my department. When we have question time with uh, people in our department, we say, "Who are you? How long have you worked here? And how long would you like to work here?" Um, <laughs> the uh, so I, I do think it's important, and I think it's important um, that we that we don't just talk about trade in terms of pure economics. And it's important in itself, but it's important politically. Um, we saw with TTIP, for example, what happens when there is a, a loss of public support for the momentum in any trade agreement. And I think that we have to make a case for free trade that is um, arguable across the whole political spectrum. So I think that goes from those arguments about uh, lifting people out of, out of poverty right through to those arguments about political stability and the contribution to our uh, wider security. And I think that we have seen, if you look at what's the recent history, for example, in North Africa, where you get a disruption of the political system and that social cohesion and a disruption of people's ability to access the prosperity that they can see online every day. Um, you can see what the reactions to that can be, uh, including trying to get in a boat and, and get to where that prosperity is. So I think that we, we need to ensure that through our global trading system, um, we are able to try to spread that prosperity as, as widely as possible. And I'll give you a very practical, very practical example. I know that sounds very high mind. I'll give you a practical example. Um, we don't yet have an e-commerce treaty um, to govern uh, that whole growing element of global trade. We know from research that was done in Geneva that of companies that trade only offline, Four out of five are owned by or run by men. Of companies that trade only online, four out of five were run by uh, uh, or owned by women. Now, what that says to me is there's not only a huge economic benefit to getting uh, regulations and a framework for global e-commerce, but there's a potentially huge development element within that as well, which is where I see those two elements of global development and global trade actually meeting in a practical sense. And of course, we're now working to try, following the World Trade uh, uh, Organization's meeting, meeting in Buenos Aires back in December, there is now momentum to try to get such an agreement. But it's, it's also, I think, uh, an example of where some of, the, uh, some of the management of the global trading system has fallen behind the actual practice of trade itself in that time. So I think they are, I think they're unavoidably linked. The point I was making earlier was, that if you think you can delink them, and you can delink prosperity, including trade, from its security consequences, you're likely to have a very unpleasant surprise coming. Hi, thank you for uh, taking my question. My name is Rachel Yumana, and I'm an intern here at the Heritage Foundation. And you said earlier that human innovation is diminishing as the days go by. So how can your relationship um, with the Heritage Foundation move forward together to help have these better trade agreements? What can you do moving forward with Heritage? Well, I'm sorry I'm, if, 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 uh, if I didn't make that clear. No, I didn't say that at all. What I'm saying is um, that those of us in the most innovative economies, and I would include the United Kingdom and the US in that, we have a chance to shape the development um, of that wider global economy. We've got a chance to help shape the rules by which many of those developments will happen. So, for example, on, on data, um, on e-commerce, um, in development of uh, the service economy more generally, um, we have a chance to actually help shape how that global uh, debate develops and also potentially how the rules and institutions that will govern that, which is why I think it's such a responsibility on us to recognize that, as I said, WTO is not something that was imposed on us. It was something that we ourselves created. Um, and therefore, we have, I think, uh, a duty to ensure that we continue to develop it in a way that is beneficial for a wider, more open trading environment. And I say that because all the evidence um, of recent years has been that the, uh, particularly the G20 countries, have been operating an increasing number of non-tariff barriers to trade. Uh, it was estimated by one study that there were about 300 in 2010, but there were about 1,200 by 2015, um, which is why I said, you know, those of us who benefited from a free and liberal trading system can't just simply say, 
I'm all right, Jack, and pull up the drawbridge behind us. That will have consequences. But for those of us who are in those innovative sectors of the global economy, we have a real opportunity to help shape that in a way that we believe will be of as much benefit to others as it has already been to us. Hi, it's, uh, it's Bordang with the London Times. And Mr. Fox, uh, if you'll indulge me, I've got two questions. First... You can have one. <laughs> first... No, you, you, you have two and I'll choose which one. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, f first, how serious do you think the threat from uh, President Trump saying that if there is no sort of hard Brexit, or as you put it, uh, a bureaucratic Brexit, that there would be no deal uh, no bilateral deal with the UK. How serious do you think that notion, how concerned are you about that notion? Uh, and secondly, to follow up on Julia's question earlier, um, as you, you know, Juncker and, and Mr. Trump are meeting today, is there anything from that meeting that you're watching that you think the UK could emulate, or is there not something from the European uh, negotiations that the UK could emulate? Thanks. Well, and the answer to your second question is what we want to see is what I think everyone wants to see is a de-escalation de uh, in the tension over tariffs at the present time so that we can try to uh, uh, get back to dealing with some of the bigger uh, issues uh, in terms of the global economy, particularly uh, as relate to the uh, elements of the Chinese economy. And on your first question, those of us, those who want to keep us, i.e. the UK, inside a customs union and a single market, which in effect is not leaving the European Union at all, would leave us in exactly the same position as we find ourselves today, which is unable to conduct an independent trade policy, which is why the government has said from the outset, no customs union, no single market. Um, and it's interesting that yet again, last week, there was another attempt in the House of Commons to try to tie our hands by binding us into customs union, um, and it was yet again rejected. Take a, a question actually, um, right at the back. Actually, so Robin Simcox is the Margaret Thatcher Fellow here at the <coughs> Thank you. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us, Dr. Fox, what you expect, uh, how closely you expect the EU and the UK to align on free movement of people after the UK leaves the EU? Well, one of the reasons that we uh, decided that we couldn't be in an EEA type relationship. And was because it required free movement. Now, I think that there's a legitimate debate to be had about what our post-Brexit migration policy looks like. And if you look at opinion polls in the UK and you look at attitudinal surveys, they will suggest that people in Britain think that people who come to Britain and who have a job and who pay their taxes and contribute to na uh, national wealth are welcome. But as you know, one of the issues in the referendum was people who had a right to come to the United Kingdom with no job and yet be able to access public services like health or schooling or housing, never having contributed to the economy before that point. And I think that um, that suggests that um, free movement is, is not something that's politically acceptable in the UK, but it does mean that we have questions to ask and answer about um, what our relationship will be with movement of labour. Um, post-Brexit. Uh, my personal view, and, and, and it is a personal view, is that we should take the opportunity to make a, a level playing field in the sense that we allow businesses within whatever parameters are set uh, on migration policy to be able to access any part of the global uh, talent pool um, equally without having preferential uh, access to uh, uh, EU citizens. But that's a, a debate that we still have to have uh, in the UK in terms of policy and will be part of what comes um, in the aftermath of, of that relationship that is decided with the European Union. I think it's an economic opportunity um, for us. Um, and, you know, as if you look at the UK, which is still the third top inward investment destination in the world and the top in Europe by, by a clear margin, um, investors will want to have a say in things like intra-company transfers which for them are, are big issues. So all, all these issues have still got to come. But I think that uh, to for any politician to say in Britain today, um, we want the continuity 
uh, of free movement of people, which was an essential one of the four freedoms of the European Union, uh, no politician would be able to sell that to the electorate, given that I believe the electorate rejected that concept at the referendum. It's, it, for, for those not in the UK, it is an interesting phenomenon um, that uh, during the referendum itself, we regarded the result of the referendum as being an instruction to politicians as to what we should do. Um, those that didn't win the referendum now seem to regard it as a consultation, not an instruction. Discuss. Carlos Avillon, uh, Bank of Central American Economic Integration. Uh, I'm a free trader, and uh, I love the trade regimes of Hong Kong and Singapore. And uh, since Britain was a was the colonial master of Hong Kong, I I have some some questions that makes you think if if if, if perhaps Mr. Trump is is right on matters of questioning orthodoxy. For example, Hong Kong from the from 1850 to 1899 uh, had free trade. Uh, no ta low taxation and very little regulation, and the economy largely stagnated in the second half of the 20th century under the same conditions. Rates of economic growth were spectacular, probably about 10, 9% annually. So why the big change that makes you think that perhaps there is something else that is more important and that has not been discovered about free trade? Uh, uh, well, I, I, I don't believe that free trade is a free-for-all. I think a uh, free trading system works best where there are rules um, and there are institutions to oversee those. That's why uh, we went from Uruguay to WTO, um, and that's why I'm a strong believer in, in a rules-based system. Um, I think a lot of the problems at the present time um, emanate from either those who are not following the rules in the way that they're set out and not behaving as proper proper. Uh, open market economies, and and on the other side, because of that behaviour, those who doubt the the efficacy of the um, and effectiveness of the the global trading institutions to manage that. So that, but it's a question, as I say, not of rejecting the system; it's of improving the system. Um, no one, when we brought the W two into being, could have foreseen the dramatic changes in the pattern of uh, of global trade. We've now got to try to learn. Uh, to navigate those. Um, but to move uh, away from where we are now, uh, the alternative to a rules-based system is a deals-based system. In other words, where the biggest, most powerful players decide the rules between them and everyone else has to follow. That is not the way I think that we create um, a pattern of, of development of trade. And ultimately, I think the best way of dealing with global poverty is to allow people to trade their way out of poverty. Uh, not for us to aid them out of poverty. Uh, a sustainable uh, trading system is the best way to achieve that. I think that does require uh, a rules-based system, and I think that requires institutions to underpin it. If we are dissatisfied with the way that that system has developed, then we should change it, not abandon it. Yeah, I think we have time for actually just one last uh, question. So, Jim Roberts. Jim Roberts, one of the editors of the Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom. I've heard from some in Europe who are deploying scare tactics trying to uh, defeat Brexit that well, they raised the specter that rapacious American companies under a U.S.-U.K. FTA would asset strip the U.K., uh, to use their words. Uh, what, what's your reaction to that sort of allegation? Um, The number of scare stories that we have lived through in the past two years um, will not be equaled um, in any near future um, period. You know, we were told we were told in our referendum that if we voted to leave the European Union, not actually left, but voted to leave, our unemployment would rise by half a million, our economy would go into recession, and international investors would abandon us. What has happened? We've added 600,000 jobs to our economy. Uh, our highest level of employment ever, our lowest level of unemployment since the early 1970s when we started to measure it in the way that we do now. Uh, 2017 uh, was a record year, 2016-17 was a record year for landing inward investment projects 
uh, in the United Kingdom. We maintained, as I said, our third position in the world for global investment last year, uh, and we were the top destination in Europe. Uh, our economy continued to grow. Um, our manufacturing increase at the moment is twice the rate of our average economic performance. Our manufacturing order books are at the best they've been since the early 1990s. You know, it really wasn't the economic apocalypse that was being predicted for the UK. So you'll excuse me if I don't take many of the predictions of doom and gloom uh, at face value that we now see. A lot of the language that you refer to is the language that was used to scare voters off TTIP. It was a lot of the arguments used against CETA, the, the EU-Canada uh, trade agreement. And the best way to deal with those scare stories is truth and fact. And if you look, for example, at the EU Canada agreement. The three most powerful attacks on it were this will mean that we have to abandon our environmental uh, legislation and uh, our Paris Treaty uh, requirements. We will see an end to the labour laws that we have at the moment and uh, we'll have no protection for workers and we will see the health services uh, being, as you say, rampantly privatised. If you look at what's actually in the, the treaty, in chapters 23 and 24, where it actually prohibits governments from specifically abandoning or watering down their environmental or labour laws purely to promote trade. And it also, in Annex 2, um, prohibits governments from giving away the power to regulate public services. All those protections are there. The anti-trade lobby will continue with the same uh, myths and distortions that they have had up till now um, through any of the trade agreements that we've had, because they're not just, they're, they're just anti-a-particular trade agreement, they're anti-trade and they're anti-capitalist and we should call them out for what they really are. Well, thank you very much, uh, Liam, for a tremendous uh, Thatcher lecture and, and also wonderful Q&A uh, as well. We wish you all the best in your discussions with the US government on advancing a free trade agenda. Uh, and we wish also the British government uh, uh, all the very best as it uh, navigates its way outside of the uh, outside of the European Union. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.